Bismillah, we're back. You're watching Way of a Muslim, defining the Muslim character. We've been talking on the subject of envy in our last segment. I want to pick up now with the reason, one of the reasons that causes envy is when people see extravagance in other people. This is something that happened at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. I'd like to relate that to you. It was the wife of Abu Darda who said to her husband, won't you seek for things to entertain your guest just like other people are seeking for things to entertain their guests? He replies back to his wife and he says, I heard the messenger, that means Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, saying, ahead of you is a steep mountain which nobody is going to be able to climb or ascend if they're overburdened. And he said, so I wish to keep my load light for this big climb. What a good teaching this is. Not to be extravagant, not to load ourselves up with things that we really can't afford in the first place just to try to entertain our guests, to try to show off for people. Oh, look at this. I just got a huge giant screen television set. Oh, by the way, we don't want you to throw away the TV set because we want you to watch our programs. But we are talking about being extravagant, not getting things that you don't really need just to show off for the guests. Sometimes the wife will try to encourage the husband to spend more money than he can afford. But it's important for the husband to sit with the wife and explain to her that this really isn't what's in Islam. What's important for us is to keep our burdens light in this life so that we'll be able to ascend that big mountain which is coming up. And this is referring to the day of judgment. All of us are going to be able to ascend up only if we get rid of these burdens here because Allah is going to ask us on the day of judgment, on Yom Hisab, we're going to be asked about the wealth, about the favors of Allah, the things that He gave us here. There's nothing that we have here that we're not going to be asked about by Allah. Even our eyesight is going to be a favor of Allah that we're going to be asked about. So this is important for us to realize that when we are extravagant and we're buying things and uh, acquiring things that we don't really need, and sh especially showing off with it, and then we're going to do what? In the last segment we talked about it, cause envy. So this is a good point for us. Avoid the things you don't really need. If you said, well, I don't, can't afford it, I don't know if I should get it, but you know that you can't afford it, then this is meaning Allah, He doesn't want you to have it. And we should be careful, especially on things like credit cards and buying things at the bank, through the bank, or buying real estate, things like this, that we don't have money for, but we go out and do this just so we can be extravagant, because that will lead to nothing but trouble. And then this is not the good character of the Muslim to do that. Let's move to the next one. We want to talk about another kind of waste. Uh, when we talk about extravagance, there's another kind of extravagance in time, wasting our time, because... The Prophet, peace be upon him, said there are two blessings which come from Allah that many people lose, and that's their health and their free time. So we need to take from our health before we get sick or ill or become incapacitated. And we need to take from our time while we still have some time to take from. You know, often people say things like, well, if I would have known this was going to happen, I would have done so and so or such and such. And if I'd have known that I was going to have that problem or this problem, I would have done so and so. But the time to have thought about that was before we had it, right? So well, you've got your health, get out there and use it for things that please Allah. And while we still have time, we need to take advantage of that before our time runs out. Because there's just so many minutes in a day. And there's just so many days in a week. And before you know it, those weeks add up to months and years. And then all of a sudden our life is gone. So before that happens, 
Let's take advantage of those two things, our health and our time. I want to come to another very important aspect of Islam is the things that Allah has forbidden for us, the things that Allah has permitted for us. This is a, a famous hadith that many of you are probably aware of. Allah said, that which is halal or lawful is clear. That which is haram or forbidden is clear. And in between them are doubtful matters about which many people who have no knowledge argue. So whoever avoids doubtful matters saves his religion and his honor. And whoever falls into these doubtful matters falls into what is forbidden. Like a shepherd who grazes his sheep too close to the private pasture of somebody else, he will soon have these sheep straying into it. Indeed, for every king there's a private pasture. Hema. Indeed, the reserve or the preserve of Allah are those things which he has forbidden. Indeed, there's a piece of flesh in the body, that if it's good, then the whole of the matter is good. But if it's bad, then the whole of the matter is bad. And that piece of flesh is the heart. To elaborate on this one just a little bit, the halal and haram is something in Islam that is so important that Allah speaks about it in the Quran in a very special way. When he talks about the people before us, taking their priests and rabbis as partners with the law. And someone said to the Prophet, peace be upon him, did they used to do that? How? How did they didn't actually worship those priests or rabbis? The Prophet ﷺ said, yes, they did. Didn't they accept from these priests and rabbis those things which were halal or haram and then reversed it, made it haram and halal? He said, well, yeah, they did that. And he said, in the same way that they do that, that's worshiping them. So Allah really hates for anybody to change his rulings and say halal when it's haram or say haram when it's halal. In other words, to make the things which are forbidden to be lawful or those things which are lawful to be forbidden. For us as Muslims today, we realize that there's an importance on knowing the difference between what's permitted, and what's forbidden. We also know that there is an area in there which there's doubt. Should we do this or should we leave it? And if there's a subject which makes you doubt, then leave that subject for something that doesn't make you doubt. Leave off those things where other people are arguing and fighting about and be safe in your deen. Be safe in your way of Islam. And this is a good quality of a Muslim to leave off those things that make you doubt for the things that don't make you doubt. And then additionally, when it talks about this idea of the shepherd grazing his sheep too close to somebody else's pasture, eventually, you know what's going to happen, those sheep are going to go into somebody else's pasture. That's obvious. But when we're comparing it here, talking about Allah's hima or reserve that he has, this is something very special this halal and haram, and the smart one stays away from it. Even the scholars, the big scholars of Islam, become very careful when somebody asks them, is this permitted or is this forbidden? You'll hear them many times start out by saying, stop for Allah, stop for Allah, stop for Allah, which means Allah forgive me, Allah forgive me. And that's before they even give you any answer. And they're going to be very careful to give you the proofs. One of the famous scholars from Egypt was saying not too long ago that it's difficult, more difficult, really, to talk about the things which are permitted in Islam than it is to talk about the things that are forbidden. He said, it's a, suppose I make something forbidden and it wasn't. At least the people will stay away from it, even maybe they didn't have to. But suppose I make something permissible and it's not permissible. Oh, my God. He said, this is really, you know, an amazing thing. So he said that, that it was harder for him to say what's the halal or permissible than it is for say what's that forbidden. 
I want to move now to something that is um, also very important when we talk about, it's related to this subject, in knowledge. And this is another saying of the prophet, peace be upon him. He said, don't seek knowledge just so that you can compete with the scholars. And don't argue with the ignorant. And don't try to gain mastery over the gatherings. Since whoever does that, then, and look how he said it, the fire, the fire. It means this is going straight into hell. And that's the one thing we all want to avoid more than anything else is hellfire. I don't want to go to hell. You don't want to go to hell. So this is a good point for us to pay attention to. When you talk about knowledge, I hear so many of our brothers, and I love our brothers so much who are seeking knowledge, and I pray for them. And I pray for me, too, to get more knowledge. But what's the purpose behind it? And this means we need to have sincerity, ikhlas, in getting this knowledge because the knowledge that you gain is for what purpose? If you want to learn the Quran so you can recite in your salah, that's beautiful. You should. That's encouraged. We mentioned that in another one of our programs. And if you want to gain knowledge in hadith, if you'd like to get experience and knowledge in the uh, fiqh or the rulings, Islamic jurisprudence, this is encouraged. But be careful what your purpose is. Keep your niya, your intention, clean. In our very first program, we spoke about the niya, the intention. Whatever you intend is what you're going to have a reward for. But when we're talking about this, there's something even bigger than that, is to keep this knowledge that you're seeking for Allah. There's a famous hadith of the Prophet wasallam that's also mentioning this subject. He said there will be three that come on the day of judgment. And one of them will be asked, what did you do with the bounties of Allah? He said, oh Allah, I was a fighter for you. I fought and died in the cause of Allah as a martyr. And he's going to be told, you did it so the people would say you were a great fighter. And they said it. Now you've had your reward, meaning you got it with the people. And then he'd be dragged on his face in the fire of hell. And then the second one would be asked, you had this great life. What did you do with the bounties of Allah? And he said, oh, Allah, I seek knowledge for your sake. And then dispense this knowledge to others. And then he'd be told, no. You did it so the people would say you were knowledgeable and be dragged on his face into hell. The third was asked something similar about the bounties of Allah. He said, oh, I had great wealth and I spent it in the cause of Allah. They said, no, you did it so people would say you were charitable and they said it. And he'd be dragged on his face to hell. So be sure that we do what we do for the sake of Allah. Let's keep our near, our intention for Allah in all things, especially in gathering this knowledge. And then until next time, Remember, it's only Allah who guides. May Allah guide us all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.